Good morning again. Let me invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Philippians as we break into the final chapter in our journey through this book. Philippians chapter 4, just verse 1 this morning, just a single verse, this verse that concludes the paragraph that we've been studying over the last couple of weeks, a single verse packed with meaning and importance for us as a church. And as always, as we read this verse, I want to urge us to remember that this is God's Word spoken to us. It is a, a word meant to shape us, meant to evaluate our minds, to define our thinking to instruct us. It's an authoritative word, lovingly brought, but brought with all of God's majestic divine right of command. So let's read this verse with that in mind. God is speaking to us. Philippians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for my joy and crown. Stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Lord, bless the preaching of your word. In the Battle of Gettysburg, at the height of of the Civil War, Colonel Joshua Chamberlain commanded a regiment from Maine. They were placed on a small ridge. They knew they could not retreat, could not withdraw, because the entire army would be made vulnerable if they pulled back. What no one knew was that the Confederates planned an attack at precisely that location, a repeated attack, unrelenting, An onslaught that forced Chamberlain's men to the very edge of their strength and to the limits of their resources and their ammunition. They could not withdraw. They could not surrender. They could not retreat. They had to stand firm. All they would have left was their superior position on the hill and their courage. Despite repeated attacks, the 20th Maine would not surrender. In fact, they ended the battle charging the enemy lines in advance of their own. As Abraham Lincoln would later say, the fields of Gettysburg became hallowed ground. Well, we stand on hallowed ground this morning. Here we are in the gathering of God's precious people, God's very voice commanding us to stand firm. We live and we are commissioned in the battle of the ages, a battle not against flesh and blood, but against the powers of this world and the traitorous urges of our own hearts. And we are called to stand firm. We must not retreat. We shall not surrender. We must not give way. You are called to stand firm. Firm, surrounded by fellow brothers and sisters in arms in the affection of that family of God that God has brought us into, committed to one another, and even more to the call of our captain to stand firm. We might summarize in our own words this sentence to say, marked by the affection of Christ, we are called to stand firm in Christ. Marked by the affection of Christ, we are called to stand firm in Christ. This sentence has three components, motivation, affection, and exhortation. And I want to walk through each of those components and then apply this exhortation to our church in as pastoral a way as I can. First, the, the motivation. Look down at your Bibles and notice Paul, as he often does, begins this command with a therefore. So he points forward first by pointing backward. These therefores, like since, Uh, and other similar words, that they are crucial in our understanding of the logic of the New Testament. Paul's commands 
always flow from God's actions. What God has called his people to always flow out of what God has done towards his people. This, therefore, in a particular way, points back to the preceding paragraph where these Philippian believers have been reminded that they belong to the heavenly kingdom. In contrast to those who are loving this earth so much, whose God is their belly, who have decided to walk in a contrary way to the gospel, these Philippians have a a higher citizenship. They've been called to Jesus' loyalty, to Christ's loyalty, to gospel priority. And I think it also points back to the entirety of chapter 3 where Paul is warning them that there are those who who want to replace Jesus and his finished work with the idea that their own righteousness is needed in addition to Jesus to get them into heaven. So they're, they're facing both doctrinal traps and carnal traps, enemies that seek to press on them the, the offer of, of pursuing their lusts and their cravings and those who try to elevate their righteousness. So whether you have a more a religious frame of mind and you want to boast in your righteousness or you're just of a more carnal frame of mind and you just want to indulge your flesh, Paul is saying both of these face the Philippian church and surely they both face our church today. And he's saying, therefore, in light of enemies that seek to devalue Christ, either doctrinally or carnally, in light of your citizenship that is in heaven, stand firm. Therefore, stand firm. And since this call to stand firm was first issued back in chapter 1, I think we can also say Paul is in some ways reminding them of everything that has gone before. He's reminding them of their identity in Christ. He's reminding them of the value of Jesus Christ, that he is superior to any other allegiance, that his righteousness is better than any righteousness we could have, that his salvation is more abundant, it's more more rich and rewarding than anything we could crave and desire for ourselves, that Jesus is superior, that Christ is life. Therefore, stand firm. Brothers and sisters, we need the reminder to look backward and remember the value of what we have in Christ to motivate and empower our call to stand firm. One danger in the Christian life is that it can be focused entirely on what we're called to do and it can neglect who we are called to do it for, and how valuable he is. That's why Paul sticks therefore all over the place. He doesn't want us to do that. He doesn't want us to just be a body full of of righteous mandates and duty and courage that forget who we're fighting for and why we're fighting in the first place. A soldier who gets into the field and is not sure why he's there or why he's wearing the uniform he's wearing or why they're the enemy or why he's even facing these risks is in great danger of losing his courage because he's forgotten. Paul doesn't want that to happen. So he says, therefore. Listen, we need to spend time on the therefores of the Bible and the therefores of our own soul. I would urge you to consider this even as you uh, disciple your own soul, as you encourage your spouse or your friends, as you encourage your children. Consider, do you spend time looking at the therefores of the faith? It's quite easy to try to be efficient and get to the commands and forget the therefores. I think this is very important when it comes to parenting. And since we dedicated children this morning, let let me urge us as parents, don't neglect the therefores. It, It is not a biblical method of discipleship to just get to obedience and righteousness and not lying and being kind to your sister and to neglect the therefore which motivates all of those actions. We're called to do those things and to stand firm in Christ because Christ is more valuable than anything else. Christ is more valuable than getting your own way. Christ is more valuable than defending yourself. Christ is more valuable than the pleasures of this earth. Christ is better, and therefore we should stand firm in obedience to Christ. Let me encourage you, parents, to just evaluate uh, your last 10 or 12 lectures. Uh, how, how many of those spent the vast majority of their time on the command 
while perhaps neglecting the why. Let me encourage you, spend time on the why. Let me encourage you in your small group gatherings, spend some time on the why. It's good to remember the why. Christ is superior. Christ is our Savior. Christ has saved us by grace alone. Christ is better than self-made religion. Christ is better than the cravings of this earth. Christ is superior. Therefore, let us stand firm. We want to be a church that is skillful in talking about the therefore, the why. We want to be skillful about that, not just skillful in talking about the commands and the obedience and the duties, but but skillful in inserting the why and the therefore. Have you ever been to the beach and you, you kind of wander out in the waves and you're enjoying the flow of the water and then you look up and you notice, I have drifted quite a ways from where I started. My loved ones are way over there and I'm way over here. And the older you get, the more you start to expect some of that drift. You, you are not surprised any longer that almost without noticing it, you have drifted in the current down the shoreline, and your location is way over there while you have moved uh, far, far away from them. Listen, if we didn't care about those people that we're related to, it wouldn't matter where we drifted. We could come ashore at any point. It wouldn't matter. But because those are our loved ones and we, because we want to be close to them and we value this particular spot on the beach, we want to fight against that drift. That's what Paul is getting at here. He's saying, look, remember that you have a loved one that is in a particular spot, namely Christ Jesus himself. Therefore, don't just drift far and farther and farther away from him. Stand firm against that drift and stay close to this precious and chosen spot that you have been given. Stay close to Christ Jesus. Therefore, in light of the value of Christ, do not drift down the shoreline following the waves of this world. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we need the reminder of why we are called to obey. We need to remind our own souls of that. We need to remind our brothers and sisters of that. We have used this phrase to preach the gospel to yourself. This, therefore, is Paul preaching the gospel again to the Philippian church. It's reminding them of who they are, of why they have to stand firm, of the current that presses against them, of the value of Jesus Christ. It's just reminding them again, I'm not just going to exhort you. I want to remind you there is motivation attached to my command. Therefore... And he doesn't just stop at the therefore. He then smothers them with affection. That's the second part of this sentence, the affection. I'm sure you noticed it. Therefore, doesn't just jump to stand firm. He doesn't say therefore stand firm. He inserts <laughs> a waterfall of affection. Therefore, my brothers could be translated my brothers and sisters whom I love and long for. He's communicating affection and a relational longing for them. Remember, Paul is likely in Rome. He's at a great distance from these believers. He, he wants to be with them. Not only does he love them, not only does he long for them, he calls them my joy and my crown. I, I want to zero in on those two words, my joy and my crown. Paul's joy is tied up with these fellow believers. He's going to exhort them, but he wants them to know the person exhorting you loves you and finds great joy in you. Paul is not just a drill sergeant issuing orders. He's a father in the faith that has great joy in these spiritual children. He says, I I have joy in you. My joy is tied up with you. It's tied up with your well-being in Christ. It's tied up with the fact that you have been brought from death to life, that that we are united in this gospel mission. I, I have joy in you. And you are my crown, he says. Paul defines the well-being of believers as a crown of honor in God's heavenly kingdom for him. He considers their well-being in Christ to be his great honor, something he is proud to wear, something he is not ashamed of, something he would glory in. 
That their well-being, their progress in the faith, their resistance to the waves of the culture is like a crown. Paul wears it proudly. You might think of, of Paul walking into heaven with a crown that says the Philippians' perseverance in the faith, that he is a proud to display their progress. You are my joy, he says. You are my crown. This, this is what it means to be a, a Christ-like discipler of others. It, it means to have this affectionate, joyful, thrilled focus on the well-being of those you are seeking to serve. Now, this is, this is a marvelous sort of waterfall of affection cascading down on this church in advance of the exhortation. It's incredible. It's, Paul's going to exhort them, stand firm, which sounds a lot more like a military leader exhorting his soldiers. Stand firm, but in the midst of that exhortation, he's just full of affection and gratefulness and tenderness and love towards them. I love you. You are my joy. You are my crown. He puts at the end of the exhortation, my beloved. What are we to take from this incredible cascade of affection. Well, it appears that the affection of Christ is meant to encourage Christians in their calling for Christ. The affection of Christ flowing through Paul to them is meant to encourage Christians in their endurance and perseverance for Christ. I find these phrases to be both a comfort and an example. They're a comfort because I believe Paul reflects the affection of Christ Jesus towards his people. Paul would have no such affection and joy in these people if the Lord Jesus had not first planted it in his heart. The one calling the Philippians to stand firm is full of affection for them. And the one calling us to stand firm is full of affection for us. Knowing that Paul felt this way about them surely motivated them all the more to stand firm. And listen, knowing that Christ Jesus feels this way about us should motivate us to stand firm as well. Jesus is is not a drill sergeant issuing commands with indifference towards the people receiving those commands. He is a a loving shepherd calling to his sheep to resist the entrapments of the evil one. If we have the wrong view of the one issuing an exhortation, eventually, eventually, we will begin to believe that that exhortation does not come from a loving heart when obeying it costs us something. Don't you know that's true in your own life? When you begin to question the good faith of the one issuing a command, you begin to be less willing to obey that command. You begin to question in your heart whether this really is worth it. Is this person really acting in my best interest? Does he really have my best interest in mind? Paul can leave no doubts. He wants them to be very clear. I'm going to command you, but I want you to know it comes from a heart of love and affection and honor and celebration of you. You are my joy, my beloved, my loved ones, and therefore I must command you. This is a comfort to us because if Paul is this way towards the Philippians, how much more is Christ Jesus this way towards us? The one who calls us to stand firm loves us even more than Paul did the Philippian church. He is even more affectionate towards us than Paul was this church. He is even more rejoicing over us than Paul does the Philippian church. He even finds it greater, more to his glory than Paul did the Philippian church. Christ Jesus, who loves his people enough to die for them, surely, surely is full of affection for them, even as he urges them to stand firm through the words of his apostle. Christ Jesus calls me to stand firm. You 
to stand firm. He warns you against the encroachments of the culture and the dangers of self-righteous legalism. He warns you against those things from a heart of affection and tender love and joy in you. I also think this is a, a marvelous example to leaders, any kind of leader, pastoral leaders, are called to exhort from a place of affection. So we receive Paul's example very directly, me, Bart, and Aaron. We receive it very directly that we had better have this same affection for you if we are going to be exhorting you from God's word. It's it's another wonderful word for parents in terms of their children, that our children would be very, very clear on our affection, our joy in them, our celebration of God's work in them, our longing for them as the atmosphere of our exhortation to them. It's valuable for any Christian looking to influence another Christian, which all Christians are called to do. Whenever you are in a a small group setting, part of your responsibility in that setting is to disciple your fellow Christians just as they are discipling you. And part of your goal in that setting should be to communicate your love and affection and gratefulness and joy for these people in advance of your communication of their need to stand firm. The steadfastness of the Christian church is never depicted in the New Testament as a soloistic, individualistic endeavor. It is always depicted as a linking of arms from one loving Christian to another, and especially leaders or those who are more mature towards those who are less mature, loving and affectionate and joyful and rejoicing and also urging and earnest commands to follow the way of Christ. Let me urge you, this is a major reason you should gather in a community group setting so that you can reflect this example to your fellow believers. So that they can hear from you. There is somebody in this Christian body for whom my progress is their joy and that They love me, and they can't wait to celebrate my victorious entrance into the eternal kingdom. There should be people that you regularly communicate. It is my joy to see your progress in the faith. And if you're neglecting doing that, you're you're letting them down in terms of giving them some of the motivation that they need to stand firm. Christians are not meant to stand firm regardless of what their brothers and sisters think of them. They're meant to stand firm with the voices of their brothers and sisters in their ears, urging and cheering them on. Paul just told this church to follow his example. He did not mean every example except for his gratefulness and affection. He didn't mean every example except for his enthusiasm for their progress in the faith. He meant to include that example as part of what it means to be a faithful Christian. The Christian church will stand firm in part when the Christian church lavishes affection and encouragement toward one another. Affection. Let me ask you. Let me ask us. Is affection and exhilarated joy a regular part of your communication to your fellow believers. It can't be an accident that Paul says this one verse before he exhorts uh, two people in this Philippian church to be reconciled in the midst of a conflict. That is not an accident. That is not an accident. So let's ask the question, is your heart full of this kind of affectionate joy in the well-being and progress of your fellow believers? Let's be honest with ourselves. Is this something that should grow, that should increase in our hearts so that we're not only concerned about our own spiritual progress, but the progress of others, and not only about critiquing them, but of celebrating an affectionate love for them as well? Paul offers commands wrapped in affection, and we should as well. I was thinking about this distinction, two different kinds of friends, and and I I was reminded of the the Winnie the Pooh gang. 
which I'm sure you've seen in various varieties over the years. Um, two characters came to mind, Rabbit and Christopher Robin. Now, Rabbit, Rabbit issues a lot of warnings and exhortations and concerns. He's a truth speaker, and he's not always wrong. It really is true that Tigger's pretty selfish. It really is true. It really is the case that Winnie the Pooh just doesn't always think things through very well. It really is the case. He's a truth speaker. He tells the truth. But he doesn't do so with affection. Rabbit is constantly annoyed with people. He finds them always in the way, never growing fast enough, never as strong or as smart or as polite as they should be. He's constantly saying, woe is me that I must live in the midst of these people. He's constantly not at home when he is at home. He's constantly looking for ways to make people less in his way. Christopher Robin is willing to tell the truth, but he's hopeful, always full of affection for his friends, never impatient with them when they are stuck in a tight place or when their foolishness has gotten them into trouble again, always ready to call them dear ones, even as he helps them move forward. Let me ask you a question. Which character are you more like? When you bump into the foolish, selfish, <laughs> lack of wisdom that is everywhere evident in the family of God, which person are you more like? More like rabbit or like Christopher Robin? More to the point. Are you like Paul? Full of affection. Not unwilling to warn and to charge, but full of affection and love, tying yourself up in their well-being? Do people get the impression that they are in your way or that you want to help them make progress in the way? Let me encourage us. Paul's example shines in this letter and others, full of affection, full of tenderness, full of hope, full of love, full of joy. Let me urge you. This is an example he means the Philippian church to follow. This is an example that God means our church to follow. Steadfast, yes, but full of affection. Now, the affection does not conclude with mere encouragement. It leads to the exhortation. The command here is to stand firm. Paul is affectionate, but not affectionate in a way that he doesn't call them to stand firm. Paul is not some kind of postmodern encourager where everyone is a winner regardless of who they're following. No, Paul is very affectionate, but also firm. Very sympathetic, very loving, very hopeful, but also direct. You must stand firm in the Lord. It's worth thinking about the other type of Christian who loves to lavish encouragement but is reluctant to call Christians to be faithful to Christ. Listen, one doesn't represent the good and kind shepherd. The other acts as though they'd rather applaud while the sheep run off a cliff. Neither represents Jesus. Paul represents Christ in his full capacity. He is loving and affectionate towards those sheep while also warning them that there is a cliff and that if they go over it, they will die. Therefore, my brothers whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, and here's the command, stand firm thus in the Lord. Stand firm. Thus, in the Lord. Stand firm means to refuse to give ground, to refuse to surrender. And it harkens back to Paul's example and the faithfulness of Christ that he has been appealing for. 
Their steadfastness, listen, is not meant to be self-defined, but God-defined, gospel-defined, and Christ-shaped. It is standing firm in the Lord. Paul is not interested in a a Christianity that says you can stand firm on those things that you find pleasing and you can surrender those things that are offensive. No, he says stand firm in the Lord according to the Lord, according to his word, according to the gospel. You must stand firm. We are called to courage, brothers and sisters, affection for one another, a family unity, joy in God's purpose, and a courageous stand for Christ. A courageous stand that will of necessity offend those who do not believe in Jesus as Lord. Paul is a loving warrior. He is rallying his troops, urging them to face the enemy without flinching, showing them with his proud affection that he cares about them and insists that they must stand firm. We stand in Christ. We are identifying with him in life or death. We are upheld by his power, the same power that raised him from the dead. This is our battle, that we stand firm in Christ. Like like those soldiers in Gettysburg, we stand on the mountain of Christ. We are weak in our own strength, but we are not weak in our position in him. We have been given the high ground in Christ, and we have only to face the enemy with courage and faith and without fear and in Christ, and we will prevail. The same affectionate, motivated exhortation comes to us today. Therefore, in light of who Christ is, with full affection and tenderness, you must stand firm. There is not a Christian here that is invulnerable to giving ground. And yet every Christian here has Christ behind them, urging them to stand firm. If you assume that your standing in Christ requires no courageous effort against the culture and against the temptations of this culture, you are in danger of falling. If you believe that standing for Christ will require disagreeing with the temptations of this culture, then you are finding yourselves right square in the middle of this book of Philippians. Because that's where these believers were. We must stand firm for Christ. Listen, the believers in Philippi were facing a very particular set of cultural challenges. Not exactly the same set of challenges that were faced by the Galatians or the Corinthians, but but their own particular set of challenges. They were similar, and we are facing a particular set of cultural challenges. Not exactly the same set of challenges faced by those believers in China or in Saudi Arabia or in Iran. A a particularly different set of challenges, but like them, we must stand firm. We must stand firm for the name of Christ in our evangelism. We stand firm by proclaiming Jesus is the only way. He is not just a way. He is the way. There is no salvation apart from confessing and believing in Jesus Christ. And if I may stand firm on this platform this morning and say, if you are here and you are a a kind and decent individual, but you have not placed your faith in Christ, there is no salvation offered by the God who is God to you. If you are more moral than your neighbors, it will do you nothing when you face heaven and say you improved the person next door. No, you must claim Jesus Christ as your Lord or there will be no entrance to heaven. We must stand firm in our evangelism. Should we be kind to those around us? Should we serve them? Should we reach out to them? Yes, but we must also stand as a church on this belief. There is one way to know God and to go into heaven, and that is belief in Jesus Christ, his finished work, paying for sins and rescuing us from darkness to light. Brothers and sisters, we must be firm in our evangelism. I I see in my own heart the cravings of convenience 
and, and the fear of embarrassment that, that would threaten to pull me away from a stand, standing firm for Christ. Let us not say we would die for Christ, but we'd rather not be embarrassed for him. Let us not say we'd rather suffer for Christ, but we'd rather not be inconvenienced for him. Let us not say we would bravely face threats for Christ, but we'd rather not risk an awkward conversation for him. Listen, that, that's me. That is, that's my self-identification of my own heart. I can see that and say, yes, I, I would say I would die for Christ, but being embarrassed for him is difficult. I'd suffer for him, but inconvenience is challenging. I, I would face threats for him, but an awkward conversation is a bit too much. No, we must stand firm for Christ, as Peter said, always ready to give a, a reason for the hope that is in us. We must stand firm for Christ through our convictions. Biblical convictions these days are becoming offensive. They used to be allowed, then they were belittled, now they are offensive. Convictions about the priority of God's people, about the purpose of God for marriage, about holiness, about servanthood in the church, about heavenly mindedness. You, you pick the conviction, it, it is becoming offensive, it, it is becoming unusual and strange. To be a genuine biblical Christian, increasingly, is becoming bizarre and outrageous in our culture. That's not because the Bible has changed. It's because the culture has increasingly decided the Bible is outdated and unenlightened. Think of just a couple of categories, biblical marriage and biblical sexuality. Is it not the case that standing firm in the Lord will require a Christian to seem unenlightened and outrageous in this culture? Do you not know family members and friends for whom standing firm in the Lord on that topic will seem offensive, even immoral to the culture? Is it not possible that saying the right thing is perceived as saying the wrong thing? Not just a strange thing, but an offensive thing. Is it not the case that we will increasingly appear to be the outdated middle age cave dwellers that have lost ourselves in a pre-modern ethic that makes no sense in the modern enlightened era? Don't we need the exhortation, stand firm? Don't we need to stand firm for holiness in our media consumption? Don't we all feel the need for that? Don't you feel the waves of acceptability pressing you further and further away from holiness and setting before your eyes no ungodly thing? I do. Because I can look at what the world watches and what I watch and think, look, look at how much better I am, rather than looking at Christ and asking, would he be sitting here watching this with me? Don't we need to stand firm in the Lord? Don't you, if you look honestly at your own heart, aren't there things that you watch that you suspect would not be watched in heaven? And yet you are a citizen of heaven as I am. Don't we feel the need to stand firm in the Lord? Have you ever had that experience, metaphorically speaking, of looking up and realizing how far have I drifted? My convictions once were here, and now they're here. And not because I've grown in grace, it's because I've grown comfortable with sin. Don't we need the exhortation to stand firm in the Lord in terms of godly online speech? Do you know that, that once in the church, it was considered a breach of the commandment to merely pass on a negative impression of a neighbor, uh, let alone to write it yourself, just to pass it on was considered a breach of bearing false witness against your neighbor. 
Don't we have need to stand firm, to get ourselves back to that location where we are standing firmly for Christ in the face of these things? You could count a zillion other opportunities where the, the culture presses us. Isn't it reasonable? Isn't it reasonable? Isn't it reasonable? Isn't it reasonable? And then there Christ is at a great distance from the convictions of his church. Stand firm. If we have not been, thankfully we serve a savior and not a tyrant. Quick to forgive, quick to invite us back to himself in repentance, to shower us with mercy, to give us fresh faith for a fresh expression of convictions in any of these areas. Stand firm. Stand firm for grace. Stand firm for holiness. Stand firm for Christ. Stand firm for his word. Stand firm for the glory of God. Stand firm as a citizen of heaven. Stand firm against the enemies of the gospel. Stand firm against the illusion that this world and its popularity will last very long because we are even now breathing a numbered amount of breaths. Our heart is beating a numbered amount of times. And soon we will see him. And how glorious will it be to say, Lord, by the grace of your spirit and power, here I am. Standing firm for you to the very end. We must stand firm, full of affection, the absence of self-righteousness towards those we disagree with or those that are in the church that are struggling, the absence of self-righteousness, but the presence of courage, the absence of bitterness, the absence of arrogance, but the presence of affection and an earnest love. Remembering the grace of God, remembering our calling in Christ, full of love, full of affection, full of joy, full of hope, and standing firm. We place our feet squarely on the rock of ages, the humbled and exalted Savior, the treasure beyond every earthly price, the pearl beyond all value, the one we were made to see. We stand firm, motivated by the value of Christ, marked by the affection of Christ. We stand firm in Christ. One of my favorite depictions movie depictions of the Chronicles of Narnia story, there's a moment where the little girl, Lucy, is, is standing on this bridge, facing her enemies with a small dagger in her hand, and the enemies come charging at her, and, and at first it just seems she's weak and vulnerable, but she stands firm, unafraid, fearless, in the face of the onslaught. And then the, the camera pans back and you see the great lion standing behind her, ready to roar and terrify all those enemies into a complete surrender. That's what Paul has in mind. Stand firm, unafraid, not shifting a single step, not compromising some doctrines so you can hold on to others. Nope, standing firm at every point, unwilling to give ground, even at a, a single sentence of Scripture, declaring this, this is our location. Live or die, we stand here. And one day the lion behind us will roar, and the enemies will flee and cower and righteousness will prevail, and sinfulness will be judged, and those weak little saints who stood firm will be exalted and honored, crowns on their heads. Redemption Hill Church, brothers and sisters, who we love and long for, our joy and crown, Stand firm thus in the Lord, our beloved. Let's pray.
Lord Jesus, thank you for dying in our place, rescuing us from darkness to light, and bringing us into your kingdom. Lord, we entrust ourselves completely to your strength, and I pray, Lord, you would give us courage to stand firm. Lord, wherever we have been drifting, Lord, bring us back and anchor us to you. Anchor us to your word. Lord, forgive us for indulging those waves of temptation. Show us mercy, Lord, and give us strength and courage to stand for you in the secret moments, in the public moments. Give us grace, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.